Welcome back to the Theocracy Podcast. I have two guests this time, the Betrothal Guys, Joshua and Caleb. I found them through a YouTube search a few months ago and found their material very insightful from a biblical law perspective. So this started as an interview as usual, but it turned into a back and forth discussion really quick. You'll notice I talk a bit more in this one than normal. I'm single and in my 30s, so that might explain my excitement. Thanks again for listening. I do ask for a dollar a month for listeners. You can set up automatic payment on voluntarytheocracy.org. I'm finishing up my first book, and I'd like to grow to publishing each episode into a series of web articles. If you know anyone who would be interested to help, you can have them email me at t-h-e-e-o-c-r-a-t at gmail.com. Theocrat with two e's at gmail.com. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. All right, I am joined by Barrett and Joshua. Welcome, you guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Before we get started into your individual stories, what was the impetus for you to to create something as specific as the betrothal guys? Um, It probably started with our wives getting together and and telling us that, hey, someone needs to be out there uh, advocating for betrothal because both Barrett and I had uh, recently, uh, we got uh, betrothed and married uh, about within a year of each other. And so our wives were enjoying the benefits of that and and wanted to, wanted us to share it with the world. Yeah. Basically my wife, she was basically, Hey, you know, people need to hear about this. There are people talking about it that don't seem to know what they're talking about. I think you should get your opinion out there. And uh, Josh was actually the one that started the patrol with guys. And he's like, would you do this with me? I'm like, yeah, I'd be interested in doing that with you. So, so can you tell me a little bit about your religious upbringings? Why don't you go first, Josh? Okay, so I went through a, a lot of different religious um, upbringings. My parents were, uh, <clears throat> well, my my mother was raised raised Baptist, and my father was saved miraculously and uh, and dramatically from drug addiction and wild lifestyle when he was seventeen. So then they they met in college and. My dad was, uh, I guess he was non-denominational, but you probably, if you were going to pick a denomination that he was close to, it'd be more like Assemblies of God, obviously with the Baptist and Assembly of God background. And then we actually went through uh, several different stages between various churches, a uh, a charity church, which is like a, uh, I guess you'd say a, a Mennonite offshoot, a little bit more closer to mainstream Christianity than uh, Mennonite. Then beyond that, we, we met in home churches. We... Uh, we started seeing how significant the laws in the Old Testament were and how they uh, they continued to be things that we should consider in our daily lives. And so through all that, we ended up with a pretty strange mixture of 
a bunch of different, well, I, I would call them truths, you know, truths from various people. So we tried to take, take hold of the truth from each step along the way and hold on to that and, and not let go, you know, not give up everything when you go on to the next one. Mm. So it, it was an interesting journey. So the best description that I would give now is that I just try to take the word of God, the Bible, and apply it to daily life. My parents were both raised Southern Baptist. Both of my grandfathers were Southern Baptist deacons. I actually appreciate the foundation that the Southern Baptist Church gave me in basic doctrine and stuff. I haven't deviated a whole lot. Salvation, how it works and things like that. I'm pretty much still Southern Baptist. you know. So what happened was mom and dad were going to this Bible study at the church on the book of Revelation. My mom and dad came out of that Bible study and and they were friends with the pastor, and he was the one leading the Bible study. My dad's like, I'm more confused now than I was going into this study. I, I was hoping for some clarification on these things. And so my dad, he said, he told my mom, he said, I'm just going to try and throw out everything, preconceived ideas. I'm going to read the book of Revelation and just try and do a study of the book of Revelation, just try and see what it says. So he actually went and got a complete Greek word study Bible start going through the book of Revelation, Greek word by Greek word and stuff. And he's like, man, I can't, I can't do this. The, there's so much from the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. I have to go get a complete Hebrew word study Bible. And so he was doing that with the book of Revelation, book of Daniel, which led him, of course, everywhere. And this study took him months. At the end of the study, he came to mom and I, and he was like, well, I don't believe in the pre-trib rapture anymore. I'm a post-trib rapture now. And he said, and I think that uh, we're a part of Israel. It's like, I'm not exactly sure what that means. And I believe that the uh, Old Testament law still applies. So, so that's, and we didn't know anybody like in our church or anything. Like we were, we were Southern Baptists. We didn't stray from the farm or anything like that. You know, we didn't know anybody even outside the denomination hardly. And so, um, my dad had a business in Colorado, Estes Park. That's where Joshua was from. And this all happened while we were living in Texas. So my dad decided we, he needed to get out of debt. So we sold our house and he put our business up in Colorado on the market. But uh, it was a hotel. So we moved back to the hotel and we stayed there until it sold. And there we found a, for lack of a better word, a Hebrew roots congregation, Messianic Judaism, Hebrew Christian thing going on. And we had a lot in common, so we started going. And so we've been going to um, home fellowships like that ever since. I like what uh, Joshua said earlier, where when you sit under different teachers and sit around different groups of people, but, you know, you have an epiphany and you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, keep what was good about that, and then move right. on and bring it, assemble a, a wider, more accurate view for yourself. Right. You don't want to spit in the well you drank from. <laughs> That's good. I haven't heard that before. Is that a Tennessee thing? Uh, I don't know. I heard it in Israel. <laughs> oh, I was in Israel on a trip and I heard a Jewish guy tell it to me once. He said it to me. So hmm. you guys are called, you call yourselves the betrothal guys. What is betrothal specifically? Cause mo I think most people associate betrothal with arranged marriages only. So what I would say betrothal is, you know, to be very specific, betrothal is the covenant aspect of marriage. Basically, everyone, pretty much every Christian believes in betrothal. They just don't necessarily think of it that way. When you think about the fact that <clears throat> before a couple goes off on their honeymoon to consummate their marriage, they stand up before witnesses and they make vows to each other. They make a covenant with each other. That is a betrothal. They're not calling it one, but to make a covenant, say, you are my husband, you are my wife, that's that's a betrothal when they make that covenant. What we see a bit different than what we have modern is in the Bible times, that covenant was usually made quite a bit in advance of leaving on the honeymoon or the groom coming to get the bride, as we see the picture of the way uh, Christ and the church works, that he's, he's coming back to get his bride. We're betrothed to him now. He's coming back to get his bride. So there's actually a time period between, whereas the way we do it now, we pretty much ignore and eliminate that time period. But it is a, it's a beautiful time period, especially because it's only during the betrothal period that we completely mirror our relationship between Christ and the church because we are currently in a betrothal period with Christ. Betrothal is 
the way that the Bible speaks of it and thinks about it. Betrothal is full on marriage. It's just that the husband and wife have not been with each other sexually yet. That's correct. And so after betrothal to cut off a betrothal required a full on divorce. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and to go back to, like I was saying, our, our, the modern parallel, if between the wedding ceremony and the honeymoon, so say at the wedding reception, someone says to them, Oh, they're not married yet. Yes, they are. They're husband and wife. That's, that's what betrothal is. They're husband and wife. They're between the ceremony and the honeymoon. It's just that, you know, biblically and what we're recommending is, is that it not just be a matter of hours or days, but that it be a, a bit longer. I think, uh, Zola Levitt, if you guys are familiar with Zola Levitt taught a little bit about this, talking about the second coming and drawing the parallel for Hebrew tradition, which was after they're betrothed. And now that they're married and it's a done deal, as far as everybody's concerned, the son goes back to his father's house to start preparing a place to bring his bride back to when Jesus says, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. That's the betrothal and awaiting the second coming, the new heavens and the new earth specifically related to betrothal. I think there was often associated and I heard you guys talk about this, uh, a bride price. And I think most people bristle at that in regard to modern day marriage. But then obviously they look at the bride price that Christ paid for his bride and everybody loves that. And that's the whole basis for, for our faith. Why do you think that there's a disconnect there? Our society has, they're basically calling what's good, evil and what's evil. Good. There was a young woman, she was talking to a group of us and she said that she hated the idea of the bridal price because it seemed demeaning to women to put a price on a woman. I don't like confrontation. So I didn't say this to her, but I remember thinking, no, the real, the real demeaning thing is to ask for a young woman for free. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and to, to not even acknowledge that she has value and to not even, to not even think about giving her family a token that represents how valuable she is. Um, not that she's actually, this is what she's literally worth. You know, we're not saying that, but this, and so to me, the, the bridal price, and you even said it, you know, Yeshua paid a price for his bride and we're like, Oh, that's great. You know, but when a young man does it with his bride, and it's like, Oh, you're backwards and primitive in reality, the bridal price in some ways is one of the more important elements of a betrothal process. Cause it, it really does represent what Yeshua did for us. It represents the gospel. Yeah. I try to imagine getting away with that at like a car dealership. I've got a car that I really want and they say, okay, that'll be, you know, twenty three and a half thousand dollars And I say, well, that's insulting to the car <laughs> or that's insulting. Yeah. That's insulting for you to ask for payment because the car is so valuable. You can't put a price on it. So you should let me have it for nothing. Yeah. As Barry said, it really is only a token. The only bride price that was ever worth more than the bride was the one Yeshua paid. Because we know we weren't worth what he went through. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're worth it to him because God is holy and he's separate and he's the only one. I think of the parallel for, I think it was Elisha. It's like God is the ever flowing jar of oil. And so if you have an ever flowing jar of oil, the most valuable thing to you is empty vessels. Hmm. I've never heard that before. That's good. So it's the counterpoint to God. That's why we're so valuable to him is because we are nothing and God can fill nothing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a side note on the, on the uh, bridal price. A lot of uh, what's popular in our circles is rubies. Uh, obviously referencing the problems, 31 woman whose worth is far more than rubies. And also um, people, it just helps people remember the price that you should pay. The ruby is red. You should blood is red. In our circles, the bridal price really is closely, tightly associated with, with what Yeshua did for his bride and the price he had to pay. So who was it? Was it a particular person that you guys heard teaching on this or did you come? How did you come to this view? You want to well, go mine, first, Josh? Mine starts, mine starts all the way back when I was a, uh, probably my earlier, early to mid teens, I was exposed to the, the teachings of Jonathan Linval 
which I believe he's at least somewhat retracted now. But he, at the time, he was uh, proposing betrothal as an alternative even to courtship and uh, to basically start the relationship with commitment, which was is pretty radical. Not everything he said did I agree with at the time. So over the next you know five or ten years and comparing what he said with what I saw going on in, in the world, well, clearly what he said was better. Clearly betrothal beats dating, which I've heard called the fornication carousel. It's not holy at all. But then, you know, over the years, my ideas about it were more formed from the different things that I saw in the scripture and from talking to my parents and and thinking about what makes sense, what it would be to treat a potential future wife with the respect that she deserves. Where do I start? How do I start that process by trying to get something from her without offering her a full commitment in return? Yeah, it's not really fair to her. Is the betrothal, is that an agreement between the husband and the wife or the husband and the father of the bride? Well, they all, they all three have to, (laughs) they all three have to be on board. A betrothed couple, the betrothed couple is the, is the husband and the wife. You're not betrothed to the father of the other girl. So I'd probably say that a betrothal is, if you want to get technical, is probably between the husband and the wife. But again, you do, you do need the father of the woman's permission or acceptance of the relationship in order for it to count. The reason why um, you need the father to sign off on it, the father of the girl, is because Torah says that he can nullify any vow she makes the day he hears of it. And if he doesn't want her to marry you, and you go and you ask for her, and then he hears, oh, she said yes to you, well, I nullify that. And so you need to go to the father and he gives you his word saying, yeah, I agree to this. And now he's giving you his word, basically, that he's not going to nullify nullify her decision. Or you get it in writing. Yeah. <laughs> For me, I guess going back to the question of how did this come about? How did I become involved in betrothal or whatever? My parents taught me from the time I was 13 or 14 that I wasn't going to date. And so I've always just kind of grown up. Dating wasn't an option. They really didn't like courtship. I don't know if they were influenced by uh, Lynn Ball's teachings or if they just came up with it on their own. I'm sure they didn't. I'm sure they had some influence, but they really wanted the commitment up front. They wanted me to be committed to her up front. I've just kind of grown up. It's just always, this is the way it's going to be. So I think your typical American evangelical would probably object, you know, what's wrong with the way that we're currently doing things. I dated or I courted and I got married and I asked the girl and she said yes. And the dad said, yeah, honey, whatever you want. Or maybe the dad just wasn't even in the picture at all. Why is that broken that we need to change culture that way? It's rarely the first one that works out in dating or courtship. Even if you're not committing fornication, say in a courtship scenario, you're still creating a lot of baggage in its wake. And the second thing is, is it's just putting the priorities backwards. If you think of the the father as the guardian of his daughter, which is kind of what he's doing, am I going to give her in marriage to this man or not? The wall, so to speak, around the vineyard. If someone tries to get into the vineyard and test out the grapes to see what they're like before going to the gatekeeper and saying, hey, can I come in? You already have a problem. He's going to be seen as a thief. You're eating the produce at the grocery store before you pay for it. A lot of our friends, they did the dating or the courting and and they say, what's the problem with it? The ones who are saying that are usually the ones who everything went well the first time. If everything goes well, it's not like anything was ruined. I still think that betrothal and, and treating it the right way, there's still a lot of uh, a lot to be gained from living through what we live through as Christ and his bride. Just that spiritual enrichment is worth having. If that was the only, if that was the only thing, it would be worth having. Um, but I think that the principles and the... Uh, the honor behind doing it leads to a better place. It leads to a marriage that's founded on obeying Yahweh rather than a marriage that's founded on, do we like each other? And that is a much stronger place to be, have a foundation of your marriage. If you eat the fruit at the store and then say, Oh, you know, I like that. I'm going to go pay for it now. Well, yeah, then everything works out fine. But I think what I, what fascinates me so much about, betrothal and a bride price up front is that I think it has in view all of the potential downfalls in mind and guards against them rather than 
saying, well, I hope these don't happen, so I'm not going to make provision for it. It's like the, the insurance is all there. I heard somebody say one time, it wasn't uh, talking about betrothal, but in regard to courtship, a couple court, and then they decide that, you know, it's probably not best to proceed with the marriage. Somebody said, oh, so their courtship failed. And the person speaking said, no, the courtship was successful. It prevented them from getting tangled up so that when they had to separate, it wasn't anywhere near as bad as it was going to be beforehand. That's a success. The, the courtship, the guard, uh, the partial guard for courtship versus betrothal was successful in its purpose. Right, but were they not tangled up? You see, that's the, that's real the question. question. Less, <laughs> I would say less than they would have been if they had been dating for years. The courtship right, was right. very intentional and all of the, their goals and interests were stated up front versus you date for six years. And then the girl's wondering if he's ever going to propose. And he was never interested in doing that in the first place. And, right. and not to get a, uh, an outrageous picture in people's heads, but in those who are trying to follow the betrothal approach, a lot of times there is interaction before making the decision. Um, so, but the amount of time spent on it and the relationship a lot of times in a courtship, they'll say, okay, let's, let's get into a relationship and see if we like each other. Let's see how we mesh. Let's see if we have chemistry. And that's when you go partway down that road, you actually get entangled. Like Bear's talking about, if you're actually looking at this up front and saying, is this a good thing? Is this God's will is a much better question to be asking. And in some ways betrothal, because it has less of this, let's see, let's see how it works. Let's test it out mentality to it. It actually forces you to make it work. Prayer. It forces you. Yeah. It forces you to make it work once you do it, but it forces you while you're thinking, while you're considering it to, uh, to seek the father more. And that when you're going into marriage, which is, you know, like one of the biggest decisions you're going to make in your life, you want to be seeking the father as much as possible. Mm. I don't know as much about this potential spouse as I do in other scenarios, but I do know someone who knows everything about them. And if you, if you're turning to him, if you're turning to God, to ask the question, is this your will or not? The foundation of that is so much better than do we like each other? Because you can fall out of love and you can fall out of like even. I have a great aunt and uncle on my mom's side. And they got married, I think, when they were like 16 and 17. Part of their culture back then was divorce wasn't an option. Because, you know, what would this do to our relationship with all of our family and friends. And then, so I think having all of this, you know, you've got the daughter that actually respects her father enough to abide by his wishes. That has to be a given. That's more foundational than betrothal even is children honoring their parents. Yeah. Are there particular laws that you see that are relevant to this whole discussion? Is there a place in scripture where it's actually spelled out? You know, it's kind of gathered from a bunch of different laws and statements. Maybe one of the ones that immediately comes to mind is um, in Exodus 22, 16 and 17, which actually talks about what should happen if a man seduces a virgin, seduces a daughter without going about it the right way. The way the law looks at it is that he is required to offer her marriage now. Even and the father still has his, you know, his guardianship, if he says, okay, this is a jerk, I'm not giving my daughter to this person regardless, the man still pays the same price as the bride price of virgins. He doesn't get to marry her if the father says no. There's this idea that there is a normal bride price for virgins. It's a normal thing for a guy to have the father decide whether or not he's going to give his daughter and for the man to pay a bride price in, in token of receiving his bride. These passages, these commandments, you know, regarding, you know, well, like the man who seduces a virgin and stuff, they all presuppose the trouble. It's not that they're commanding it per se, but it just assumes this is what you're doing, you know. And when you see, you know, in Scripture that Yeshua does it with his bride and stuff, all throughout Scripture, this is just a thing that's assumed. It's just presupposed that you're going to do. And the commandments are based on on that presupposition and in order to fulfill these commandments the way they were intended to be kept in order to deal with fornication a man just a virgin the way yahoo want us to deal with it you have to be doing betrothal 
it's kind of like the law. You see a bunch of diff- betrothal mentioned in a bunch of different statutes. You know, this person's free from going to war while he's betrothed. This person is, here's the penalties if the person's betrothed. Here's, you know, just the various statutes. Like Barry said, it, the law assumes that people are, are doing betrothal. The, the scripture assumes that people are wearing clothing. There's not exactly a commandment anywhere that just says exactly what to wear, but the assumption is people are wearing clothing. And we have that same assumption throughout scripture that we're practicing betrothal. What are some of the cultural changes that you guys see that are actually happening and actually excite you guys about the work that you're doing? That people, when they start seeing betrothal and stuff, they actually feel more connected to Yeshua. They're like, oh, wait a minute. This is the process we're in with Yeshua. This is what he's doing with us. That, oh, okay. They get excited about just their relationship with Yeshua. I'm betrothed to Yeshua. I'm betrothed to the king of the universe. He's going to come back and get me. It makes it more real to a lot of people. Anyone who, uh, who has seen a betrothed couple when they come together for their wedding celebration, uh, to see them see each other after their separation. And, and most of the people who are practicing betrothal also practice a separation time, just like we see with Christ is currently not here. He's coming back later. To see that joy and that pure love and to realize Yeshua's love for us is even greater and even more pure. And that that's what the way we're called to love him back. There, there's just the picture right in front of you, living in front of you, or when you go through it, even even on a greater level, to live it out, that picture is just... You know, it, there's you, an intensity to it. Yeah, you, there's a, there's, you can't describe it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an intensity that you're experiencing. Like when you see these this couple come together after the patrol period and they haven't seen each other. You know, you can just feel the love that they have for each other, and it's exciting and it's it's cool. And you're like, wow, this is what the prophets are talking about: the voice of the bride and the voice of the bridegroom. This is it. There's something else that I think has been missing all this, not paying a bride price as well. I've heard fathers joke about having to pay for the, for the wedding and it can't be fun, but I think that it's kind of reversed in how a, a father should feel when his daughter gets married. It shouldn't hurt him. It should bless him. The person, if anybody, that it's supposed to hurt is the groom. Right. Right. Because the groom is getting the greatest gift. He who finds a wife has found a good thing and obtained pleasure of Yahweh. Here's this guy. He's getting a wife out of the deal. The dad's losing his daughter. Back then in a patriarchal society, they might not be from the same tribe. He's going to take her and go live somewhere else with his clan and his family and, and stuff. And so the dad is really giving his daughter away. And it says, you know, take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to sons, you know? And so here's this dad, he's giving away his daughter and he's not being re- recompensed and he has to pay for the wedding. You know, it's like, wait a minute. It's like, you're making him pay to get rid of his daughter. All right. You know, <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. You know, is she worth, you know, I, I she's a negative value instead of a positive value. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the picture it's painting. You know, I heard um, Dennis Prager say years ago on the radio, if you ever want somebody to value a book and read it, don't ever give them a book for free. Make them pay yeah. you a dollar. Because then it's in their mind when they see that book sitting on the shelf, they're like, I paid for that. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's the same thing. Charging somebody a dollar for that book isn't this unspiritual thing. It's calling the other person to commit and put some skin in the game. And I think it should be the same way for a relationship between a husband and a wife. I've talked to several women that feel insulted by that. They need uh, an extra guard of some kind. Instead of saying like, nope, the man and the woman are the same and they're on perfectly equal footing. And if the husband abandons his wife, it's just as bad as if a wife abandons her husband. I I think they don't like that inequality with the roles that they're having to play where the woman is playing the role of the humble one. And the man is playing the role of the one with the power. 
But if you don't have that to start with, then you've completely robbed the entire picture of the gospel that we're given. Right. What our betrothals are trying to get at is that this woman is a value. This is worth striving for. This is worth you working for seven years. This woman is worth that. And scripture is trying to say, hey, if you want to marry somebody, show her that and, and her father that you value her. That they're just getting it backwards. Modern society, we get a lot of stuff backwards. Mm. You know, it's like, hey, it's not just in betrothal, it's other things, you know, abortion. And you should have said it, they'll say, blessed is the womb that never gave birth. And that's what people think. They're like, oh, it, it's better not to have kids. That's not true. You know, <laughs> that's not what scripture teaches. The Bible says that debt is a curse and that children are a blessing, but then you have people applying for debt and rejecting children. Yeah. It seems kind of backwards. It's not a sin necessarily to be in debt. It's not a sin not to have children, but when your desire is for the opposite, you don't want blessing and you do want curses. Your, your values are, are backwards. It's what Josh just said earlier. Their, their, their value system needs to be rearranged somehow to get these things right. You know, there are certain things that you really should want and certain things you should really want to avoid. Modern American society, a lot of times we just we put them backwards. What are some of the arguments that you guys have gotten in opposition to this? What do people say? What are their reactions? The one I've seen the most is it's just cultural. That's just culture. Don't worry about it. That's just a random fact of history. Don't lose any sleep over it. And to me, that's like. So it's not so much opposition as it is just. They're just dismissing it. When you start talking to them more, then they can become a little bit more militant against it. And you're going, well, if this is just culture, why are you so against me doing it? And so they'll say, it's just cultural. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, you can do what you want. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to do it. And they're like, well, why are you doing that? You know, well, if it's just cultural, what's the problem? When Yahweh tells us, you know, in Hosea, he says, I, I betrothed Israel to myself in righteousness and loving kindness and things like that. Yahweh is being an example there in scripture when it says, you know, one of the reasons why we should observe the Sabbath in the Torah, it says, because Yahweh, your Elohim, created the heavens and earth in six days and on the seventh day he rested. You know, and Yahweh is a great role model. I don't know if y'all know that, but he's like, the epitome of role models. And so if you see him doing something and it's not forbidden for you to do it, there's a really good chance you should be trying to do it the way he does it. So I wanted to ask you about one thing that you said earlier. Christ is betrothed to his bride now and that their union is not consummated. I've always thought of his death on the cross and being buried in the tomb. The scripture refers to Christ as God's seed that he planted when Christ was buried. Was that not the planting of the seed? Was that not the consummation of the union? Um, I would say no. Um, you have in revelation yet to come the marriage supper of the lamb. The marriage supper is celebrated at the time of consummation. You have, I think it's a uh, second Corinthians 11 two. Paul is talking to the Corinthians. He says, I have betrothed you as a chaste virgin to Messiah. So the, the time frame that we're in now is betrothal. If you start looking at betrothal to Yeshua, the analogies regarding Yeshua and his bride are unfinished. The consummation and the wedding supper and the bride adorning herself and coming out of her chamber and being presented to the groom have not yet occurred. I would look at, and it's what we've been talking about. I, I would look at Yeshua's death and being buried in the ground and stuff as the bridal price, not the consummation. Okay. Interesting. Oh, that's true. Though I'm thinking, I'm wondering if they can be one and the same thing, because also we know that because of his death in his bride, it is bearing fruit because of that union already. It's not delaying in bearing fruit. It's been bearing fruit for ever since then until now as well. Right. If by bearing fruit, you mean uh, more believers are being added to the bride, the, the bride is growing. I, I don't know that we necessarily say that there's children of the bride, so to speak. The, the fruit that from marriage, the children is something that happens after consummation, whereas the fruit that we're experiencing is the bride is growing, which might be more akin to if you're counting all believers as this one body, this one 
woman, this one bride. So during the betrothal period, a bride has this time period to learn about her husband, to learn his likes, his dislikes, even practical things like what kind of meals does he like, you know, that I should learn how to cook from his mom or, you know, things like that. And so in that way, she's, it's not the fruit of children, but it, it's, it's almost like the sanctification process. She's learning what her husband likes and she's growing in that knowledge and learning how to apply it. Mm. That type of stuff will typically happen pretty early on in the dating when people are seeing if they have chemistry. And I really have felt strongly that that's the type of stuff that why do that if it's not going to work out? Why not save all that stuff after marriage? You have a lot of guys getting rejected by girls because the guy doesn't know how to treat a wife. Part of me goes, well, duh, he's not married. Yeah. He's supposed to yeah. learn that as things go. If you if you find a guy that knows how to treat a wife, like the way she would you, be like, how many women have you practiced with? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? That's like, exactly my question. So all the girl, all the guys that are really suave with the ladies, they've been honing this skill on a lot of other women. Yeah. Right. So there's there is you know one of the the arguments that people will sometimes bring up against betrothal to say, but to just uh, have a couple come together, not knowing each other to not even necessarily like each other. You know, they're usually thinking in arranged marriage terms where they haven't even seen each other or whatever, but they said, I, you know, I can just, I could just never do that. It is mostly the women that think that this would, this is a bad idea. For the most part, men are a bit more gambling and risk takers. So men were like, okay, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take a chance. You know, they'll, they'll go for it. But to women, it doesn't feel safe is a reasonable objection. Women are, were designed to be protected and guarded, like we've, like we've talked about. And that's not a flaw. That's what makes them so valuable. That is part of the design, for sure. But part of what is being skipped and not thought through is the fact that during betrothal, when you have a 100% commitment from this man and he begins to woo you, because during the betrothal, I believe, is a, is a time for, for a, a, a wooing and a connecting process and learning about each other to begin – to be able to woo in complete safety with no fear of rejection coming up later allows your heart and your your emotions and your and your spirits to connect in complete safety because the, that 100% we are husband and wife commitment is on the line and before you have to worry about the physical which can be scary for a lot of the women it is kind of scary to think about the physical when they're out at the beginning of the relationship they want to feel safe and connected emotionally first so during the betrothal period to be able to connect emotionally and spiritually in such a safe place, it allows for a gr greater depth and opening up to each other because it's being done where there is no fear of rejection. It feels like you would have a lot more of a running start getting into the consummation instead of it yeah. being super, super guarded with the people that do understand the pitfalls of dating. They try to be super guarded so that then by the time they get married, they've been purposefully putting on the brakes the whole time. The inability to open up those floodgates, there always, there's always a little being held in reserve in the courtship uh, relationships. It used to be in the past that during an engagement, people would open up more. But with so many broken engagements now, even engagement is not considered safe anymore. We know it. We don't open up even during an engagement, you know, the way we should in betrothal, I'll say. On the physical side of things, you know, during consummation and stuff, that awkwardness during, you know, your first encounter with your wife that's not a flaw in betrothal that's a feature you know that's that's something that we expect to happen because this man and this woman have not been messing around with other people they're not supposed to be comfortable with intimacy you know that this is something they're supposed to explore and grow in together with each other even not on the physical side, even the beginning of the betrothal, there is a, uh, there's an awkwardness, especially if you haven't known each other very much. You know, it's the father's will for you to get betrothed, but you don't necessarily know each other that well. There can be an awkwardness even then. But again, it's a beautiful thing. How quickly when you say, okay, I'm shut the door and I'm throwing away the key. We're here forever. That safety to open up then produces just a, a beautiful relationship 
the scripture puts it, you know, it sometimes will say like be of one mind or, or the twain will be one flesh or the two become one. The oneness, the, the unity that can happen when there's a safety to fully open and, and to be able to start that, you know, well in advance of having to deal with the physical awkwardness allows you to build a, a much deeper relationship. I think the foundation, again, I guess one of my, the things that I really like about betrothal is I think it gives the foundation of marriage such a good head start that, you know, you can still ruin it, but it gives you such a good head start and a foundation that you should have a, a fighting chance. We're focused a lot on, you know, like we're envisioning a young man and young woman who don't know each other from Adam. And while that does happen, or they practically don't, they might have seen each other across the room at a few feasts or fellowships or something. But for the most part, most people that I know, they've actually been fairly familiar with their spouse. They were either childhood friends. They've known each other for years. My brother, he recently got betrothed and, and married. We've known his spouse since she was four years old. A lot of people just assume, oh, betrothal, I'm going to marry somebody I don't know. That's not necessarily the case. A lot of them have known their spouse and were friends, you know, even beforehand. I've come to the conclusion that I don't think women were designed to be able to tell if a man is trustworthy or not quickly. There's a strength in that. I think that's what makes them so valuable as a wife. The wife eventually takes on the likeness of her husband, just the same way that we do with Christ. We become conformed to his image. We're clay that's molded into the shape that the father wants. But a another man can tell, and that's the whole idea of the father being her protector. So he's the one that has the discretion and the discernment to be able to tell yeah, honey, I know you think that this guy is, is wonderful, but there's also some questions that you never asked about either financial things or being able to provide for a family that are huge red flags. And so you may feel all lovey-dovey through the dating relationship, but then if you guys were to actually get married, you'd be completely miserable and to be able to protect her from that. Obviously we're all individuals, but in general, women are a bit more flexible than men, like you talked about. And I think it goes, it goes all the way back to the to original design. A creation, the woman was created to be able to help the man. And a man who doesn't appreciate that, who doesn't uh, nurture and, uh, well, a, a, as uh, I believe Peter puts it, to live with her in an understanding manner can spoil that. But it is true. It seems like even the, uh, even the worst characters out there, the worst men out there, will often have a woman, a girlfriend or a wife or something that is sticking with him through it all. Even though you know, he could be a psychopath, serial killer, and, and she's right there with him, and she may even know about it, and, she's, and she still you know, supports him. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is something that women are designed to be the helper. But what that means is that the responsibility for the man to be righteous and to lead in righteousness and to walk in a way where the person who helps him is thereby helping the world, the responsibility for the man is doubled. Mm. Men need to step up and be men. And, and follow Yeshua, follow Christ with all their heart, because if they don't, they're not just messing themselves up. They're messing up their wife. They're messing up their children. The whole idea of a wife is what enables a husband to bear fruit. A guy can't have kids all on his own. And so, yeah, the man has power, but a man alone is not as powerful as a man with a wife, which is his force then multiplied. Right. And it's the same thing with, with the idea of a seed. Yeah, you can eat a grain of wheat all by itself, but if you're if you're willing to give it up and sacrifice it for the earth, offer it to the earth, then you'll get back more than you started with. Yeah. And and the just the value of a of a good woman, I mean Proverbs 31 says that um you know, the Proverbs 31 went her husband is known the gates when he sits among the elders. She helps him look good. You know, I mean, she He's not as powerful without her as he is with her. That's more than just bearing children. That's relationship. That's being recognized among the elders. That's That goes a lot further. To have a good wife is a fantastic asset. I, I don't even like talking about it like in terms like that, but she is. She's an asset. She's there to help him. The chances of him being able to accomplish his goals with a good woman supporting him increase dramatically. I heard Jordan Peterson say recently that guys are typically 
much more interested in things and women are much more interested in people. I feel like the whole conversation has gotten shifted to where you're not allowed to talk about marriage in guy terms that resonates with men. You have to talk about marriage from only the woman's perspective. What's the saying? If you want to, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Well, food (laughs) is, food is stuff. Food is things. Food is not seen as a particularly spiritual thing and neither is money. But when you're talking about guys, men's identity is, I think, a lot more often wrapped up in how much money they make versus a woman needs to feel like there's peace and harmony in her relationships. She's much more relationship with other people focused where a guy doesn't. And neither one of those is a flaw. It's part of their counter design to one another. That's also somehow unified in marriage. What would you recommend that married people do knowing these things and thinking this way? And what would you recommend that single people do? Well, married people need to uh, follow the biblical command to teach these things diligently to your children. It's the ones who are married who are speaking of this to their children and their grandchildren um, that are going to influence the next generations, the ones that are arising. And that's where you can actually have a growth or, or a, uh, or a revival or a, a restoration as far as uh, singles, the first thing I usually tell a single that gets excited about betrothal that is getting on board with it is is to start praying. Start praying and asking the Father what His will is for you, to be prepared to follow His will, to take marriage off of a, an idolatry standpoint where it's about me and what I'm going to like. Who am I going to like? Would, would I live happily with this person? And, and reverse that and make it into a, uh, what does the father have for me? What does the father want from me? So that it becomes focused on him. That would be the first thing I would tell singles. Just for the sake of balance, I would say that we have had, uh, you, you do have to be careful when you're restoring things that you don't swing the pendulum all the way to the, over to the other side. Like we talked about, you take hold of the truth. You don't jump completely off and throw everything behind you. You got to hold on to that truth as you move along. There is a uh, a cultural problem in parts of Africa, and we've seen this because we've had we've been contacted through our our websites. In an agricultural society like you're talking about, it would be some sort of fair compensation. In our society, it's usually more of a token. But even in their society, the bride prices that are being asked are so much more than a single man could ever hope to raise that it basically makes it impossible for these men to get married. And it actually drives them to go and just you know live with a girl and commit fornication rather than marry her. You end up breaking down what you've been trying to accomplish. If you take the bride price to an extreme and say, yes, you need to pay me the full value of my daughter, you know, six because, million. To be honest, to be honest, that's not possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When, when, if a guy is looking for the full value of his daughter, and this is where women are right when they get offended, they're like, we're, we're, we're beyond that value, that monetary value or whatever it is you're giving my dad. And I'm like, I totally agree. And so for a dad, that's why say, it was hey, such a no brainer to-, to give it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. For a dad to say, Hey, you know, you need to pay me like seven years wages, you know? And so it's like, well, I can't, I can't do that. You know? And, and basically dad's just making it where no one can marry his daughter. What are y'all's thoughts on engagement rings? I think the reason that those took off, I guess it seems like, I'm not exactly sure what people would do prior to that, but I've talked with some women. They're very curious in how much it costs the guy. And then some that really don't care at all. They're like, you could have gotten me a plastic, a plastic ring and I wouldn't care. But I feel like for the guy, do you feel like the reason that that's become such a cultural norm has anything to do with the, you know, the eternal principles of the bride price? Um, um, yeah. <laughs> if you study the history of it, which I haven't personally, but my wife has, and she's shared a lot with me. So like now in the modern, the modern Jewish ceremony, there's not actually usually a bride price paid to the father. The man gives the woman a ring and that's considered the token, but they actually forbid the woman to give the man a ring because they do consider that basically the bride price. 
So she she can give him a ring, but she can't give him a ring, you know, as part of the wedding or the or the ceremony or anything connected to the the wedding. We actually did morph from that. So I'm, you know, fairly certain that our engagement ring idea or wedding ring idea came from the bride price. We shifted it from the father to the daughter kind of thing. Hmm. Well, and isn't in the Song of Solomon, isn't there something talked about like adorn your bride to give her rings for her nose or something like that? Sure. And, and you also have the story of uh, uh, when when uh, Abraham's servant goes to get Rebecca as a wife for Isaac, he gives gifts to her and to her family and also to her father. I think that's so where not, the, the nose not, ring comes from. I think that's right. Yeah, it is possibly that. It's possible that was a nose ring. The word is face, so it could be an earring or you know somewhere on the face. But you know, one question that we get asked a lot, so you'll probably want this, otherwise you'll get it. Is I don't have parents or or mentors or anybody to help me guide this. A single will say that. How can I do this when I don't really have anybody? And to some extent, if a uh, well, we even see this in the law that the, the uh, daughters of Zelophehad, whose father was dead, were told to marry whom they think best. So they didn't necessarily have a father to, to guide them. So they kind of were left on their own to, uh, you know, accept who came along that they could choose to marry. Um, so there are some people that are going to be left in that category where their, where their father is dead or they really have no spiritual guidance from their parents. Because this is kind of a, a new revived thing so that you won't necessarily have the whole family on board. It's beautiful when you do, but you don't always. One recommendation I make is to uh, to get involved with your spiritual family in such a way that even if the uh, the approach needs to be made to you personally, you have people to discuss it with and you're not left on your own trying to navigate the emotions at the same time. So you, you've got your uh, you, the elders in your church or your pastor or whoever you, you have that you trust to think through what's being done on a spiritual level and not just on, oh, I feel good when I'm with this person. I think it was in uh, one of Rush Dooney's Institutes of Biblical Law where he talks about the tradition of what the dowry was. And the dowry was essentially the bride price paid to the father. If that's paid to the father and then the father leaves an inheritance to his children, he would leave an inheritance to, to his daughter, I believe, as well. At least that was uh, Rush Dooney's opinion. So then eventually the husband doesn't, if he remains faithful to his wife, doesn't permanently lose that bride price. Some of it comes back to his children in the form of an inheritance from his wife's father. Yeah, there is at least a slight amount of biblical evidence for that. Um, if you look in the uh, – um, you look at Jacob when he's getting ready to run away from Laban. He's talking to his wives and they say, yes, our father has sold us and he's spent everything, the price that was paid for us. So it, it did seem like that there might've been some thought that they should have inherited from him. And they're saying there's nothing left there for us to inherit. So it does seem like there probably is some, uh, some truth to that. I don't see any statutes that outline how that works, but it does seem like it was at least, um, that would be normal, a normal course. It would events. be a norm. Yeah. One of the exceptions to that we're dealing with money and stuff. And probably a lot of fathers would give their daughters when he died money as an inheritance. I think that when they were going into the land, and this might have been what you were thinking of with Zelophehad's daughters. There were six daughters and no sons. And he was from the tribe of Manasseh, I think. And yeah, that was more bound up in tribe, uh, tribal inheritance cause for yeah, related cause to year land, jubilee and all that. Yeah, and so you had the year of uh, release and the Sabbath year and the jubilee year and stuff. And in Zelophehad's daughter's case, the elders from the tribe of Joseph, the leaders, they came from Ephraim and Manasseh. They came to Moses They're like, hey, if we give... Zelophehad's daughters and inheritance, as you've said, you know, and I think they're talking about the land here more than anything else. Then if they marry somebody, that the tribes of Manasseh will lose that. They'll land be reduced to yeah, it will be reduced. And so most like you're right, you know, if they're gonna receive an inheritance, uh, they need to marry a close relative of their father. And so I think they all ended up marrying their first cousins. That way it kept the inheritance with the tribe of Manasseh, the land. And so, and so I think that, of course, we're not in the land of Israel, you know, things like that. And we can get into all kinds of what should we do, you know, stuff. But, but yeah, for money, I think that it was probably common for a father to leave money for his daughter. 
but the land was probably something that could only be left to sons. Well, and if we're talking, you know, if they went to Moses for that question, then they weren't, they weren't in the land quite yet. Although I guess Ephraim right. and, and Ephraim took the took half land across the Jordan in their land, I think. Right. Because that wasn't across the Jordan. Mm -hmm. They took it on, they took it before they crossed. Yeah, it was it's, near the end. End. it's recorded in numbers, but yeah, it's, it was towards the end because they talked about how their father died in the wilderness. Um, the the oh, daughters right. of Lof had when they brought their case, talked about their father, how he had died in the wilderness, not from any, not from any special rebellion, but just because as a nation, they were all yeah. dying in the wilderness. One story that's kind of interesting is the story of Caleb. When he comes into the land, he actually asks for for the bride price for his daughter, what he asked what for was someone to conquer a city. Mm -hmm. And then after the guy, con uh, Othniel comes and conquers the city, Caleb's daughter says, you know, I want with my dowry for when I get married, give me the I upper like and the lower springs, springs. Of waters. So she actually asked for, she actually asked for a uh, present or a, uh, an upfront inheritance, an upfront dowry. And it, it probably, she was an heiress. Probably she was, there were no, Caleb didn't have sons. I don't don't remember if I if we know that for sure or not, but and that's why she would go ahead and ask for some of the land immediately that she was going to get later. Interesting. And it worked out because Othniel was Caleb's nephew, what or brother? No, no, no. So it brother. all stayed within this tribe. Brother's anyway. son, I believe. His brother's son. He was a close relative of Caleb, and so that would still uh, fulfill the requirements uh, that Moses laid down with Zelophehad's daughters. All yeah, all the the inheritance still stayed within the same tribe. Yeah. Thank you guys for doing this interview. Hey. And uh, thanks for having us. This is some very thought provoking stuff. Hopefully, yeah. we weren't too boring. <laughs> mm. Always like to talk about betrothal, kind of like a passion of mine. <laughs> yeah. It's important. It's a way we can live out what Yeshua has done for us with our brides. It's a picture of the gospel. I think it's fantastic. Well, thanks again. Thank you. So we got to the end of the interview, and I forgot to ask Caleb and Joshua to plug their stuff. If you'd like to learn more about their ministry and get a free ebook, you can visit betrothalandwedding.com. Betrothalandwedding.com. They have testimonials of betrothals, and for those interested in following God's design for entering into a marriage covenant, they're working on creating a singles directory. Betrothalandwedding.com.